Hello everyone and welcome to the PMLD Conferences Event 2. I'm delighted to be given this opportunity to speak with you all today. My name is Carrie Ann Sutton. I am a teaching assistant in an outstanding special school in South Wales. I'm a creative arts practitioner and I'm currently in my second year at the University of Birmingham studying a Master's in Severe Profound and Multiple Learning Disabilities. We are nearly two years down the line since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic and there is still so much uncertainty as to how we continue forward. Now, I'm no expert and have always considered myself just an LSA, something Joanna Grace was very quick to point out to me that I wasn't just an LSA, but I was an important member of the team and that we all have an important role to play. It is impossible, in my opinion, to find someone whose life has not been touched in one way or another by the COVID pandemic. And as an aspiring teacher for children with PMLD, this has heightened my interest in my research and my learning. In fact, one of my first assignments on the SPMLD course was researching the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the education of children with PMLD. In the process of this research, I reached out to a number of colleagues, family, friends, looked at numerous reports and articles on the subject, examined how daily life had changed for people with PMLD. It's important to note that due to how predominant the pandemic is, our understanding of COVID is forever developing and new strains are being brought to light, causing more restrictions and disruptions to everyday life. COVID-19 has increased risks, it's compounded health needs and disproportionately affected socio-economical lives of people with disabilities all over the world. The World Health Organization estimates that the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted or completely halted critical mental health services in 93% of countries. This is during a time when the need is greater than ever. The pandemic has brought increased stress, isolation, bereavement and trauma, not to mention neurological and psychological impacts of the virus itself. The measurements implemented by the government to tackle the situation will certainly have huge impact of not only the children and young people we represent, but people of all ages. As an LSA, I have been fortunate enough to work closely with children and young people with a range of disabilities but since COVID-19 the way we work and care for these individuals has changed greatly. We are more wary of the risks, everyone is vulnerable and the need to be vigilant is of paramount importance. The pandemic has created a plethora of changes to daily, changes, challenges to daily life. For many, it meant no access to a range of activities, therapies, interactive programmes, visits to day centres, respite care, and not to mention school closures. These all being vital to people living with complex needs as well as breaking of a routine and the lack of physical intervention. Many also went without the support of equipment, such as walking frames, chairs, standing frames, these reasons being because they could have grown out of them or they could have broken. This shrinking social network which affected all of society coupled with the need to wear PPE, social distance and the constant washing of hands posed an added problem for people with learning disabilities who often struggle with change and the very nature of the rapid introduction of these rules made it particularly difficult. In 2020, Mencap Cymru conducted a survey of what carers experienced during this time and their findings were worrying to say the least. 
negative impact on the mental and physical health, reduction in daily living skills and independence. They link this to day centres and respite setting closures and a reduction in social care provisions with the need to shield causing isolation. Learning to adapt whilst facing our own fears about COVID was an anxious time for everyone. Uh, adapting and changing our ways of thinking so that we could continue to support and care for each other. For many of us, there is a balance between the anxiety of going to work each day with the increased risk of exposure and the worry of passing a virus on to the people in our care as well as our families and their families. On the other hand, many of us loved the thought of having a routine which allowed us a glimpse of normality which helped our mental well-being. There's a true sense of togetherness that speaks volumes in itself. We are lucky that we live in a technical age as the use of internet has helped in respect of communication. Sam Murray mentions in his article published in PMLD Link Journal, summer of 2021, that the great thing about being in a special school is that having to think outside the box is daily practice for our teachers. Establishing a bond between carers was essential to online learning, as many of them were quite apprehensive about technology. This offered some a lifeline, a form of interaction, but for a number of people it was still out of reach. In these cases, other methods were used, such as home packs, video calls, social distancing, doorstep visits. When speaking to Ellie Chapel, it was pointed out by her that honest human conversation and remembering that everyone has struggled and the anxiety about the grey space we now find ourselves in has peaked for many, whereas before the pandemic, we maybe didn't understand the importance of real human connection and how it uplifts us all. People like her own daughter, Ella, have experienced many restrictions and have done so because of society. I hope that the experience we have had will shape the power of human connection for everyone. And these are words I found captured the very essence of what we're battling against. As the virus continues to affect our lives with the disruption in our relationships with family, friends, colleagues, this is felt even more so by a person who lives with a disability, making them more vulnerable. Losing continuity and face-to-face -face contact can leave them feeling worried and frightened and open to mental health problems. Staying connected is key. A phone call, a text, an email or even a letter can show just how much we care and can help with breaking down the loneliness. As I mentioned before, not everyone's comfortable with technology. Throughout the pandemic, we have many people who have inspired us with their dedication, from teachers, carers, NHS staff, supermarket staff, those who have selflessly kept going to keep everything running smoothly and as routine as possible, some people who might not work directly in our field but have been essential in some way to us and what we've been trying to achieve. We have to ask ourselves what we have learned throughout the pandemic. The lack of preparation throughout this major incident stands out to me. From shortages of essential PPE to the disruption in services which is essential to everyday life. I know that hindsight is a wonderful thing and the speed in which the virus took over our lives, but governments need to learn from this and realise that if a person living without a disability and um, without vulnerabilities found it difficult, then those with extreme vulnerabilities and complex needs are at a disadvantage without the added strain of COVID, regardless of the nature of their disability. It's I know it's been hard for everyone and that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected everyone in different ways, but hopefully people in authority all over the world will sit up and recognise how important children, young people and adults with disabilities are and what they contribute to society. 
people with disabilities already face huge barriers to accessing healthcare. Not only do many people with disabilities require additional and specialist services, but the costs, limited availability, physical barriers to accessing these mean some of the most vulnerable are not receiving the care they need. And many are isolated and excluded from society. Not only that, but the prejudice and misconceptions mean that people living with a disability are more likely to be abused or neglected by healthcare workers, communities and their own families. Add to this then the communication barriers that they also face. For example, lack of sign language provision or children not being allowed to attend school. The pressure on health services during the pandemic have only served to increase this disparity with so many health services redirected to tackle the virus, the already limited support for people with disabilities is disappearing. Supporting people to keep safe and face the challenges posed by the pandemic and continuing to work and strengthen systems that we need in society include education, communication and also social safety nets. It's essential to help people to understand their rights working towards access to services for the most vulnerable. We, we can do this by ensuring that our programmes continue to build resilience and focus on developing people's capacity through our actions, thus creating an environment rather than creating dependency. We were thrown into an unknown environment in which there was an increase in demand to learn from each other teachers saw a proliferation of webinars, articles, forums, all aimed at helping share the practice and experiences of other schools from all around the world. Although the impact of the relationship between school and home has been recognised for many years, the importance of good communication in sustaining and nurturing this relationship was brought to the forefront of educational planning. Schools have adapted and strengthened their communication strategies to try and bring parents more fully into the learning conversation. And largely this seems to have worked. Parents have shared that they now feel valued. They now feel like they have a voice. But it's also, the pandemic has also highlighted the importance of pupil voice more than ever before and child-centered learning listening to the individuals and their preferences. Throughout the pandemic, schools, school staff have worked tirelessly to enable education to continue online, but some pupils found this experience hard, difficult to differentiate between home and school life, whereas some pupils flourished throughout and were more suited to a calm environment, where a class was quiet, less noise, which meant less sensory overload and anxiety. To ensure we keep children learning, we draw on the experience and expertise we've developed from existing education, creating technological solutions and encouraging use of versatile learning resources that can be accessed anywhere at any time. Pupils experienced smaller class sizes, which allowed more one-to-one -one time with teachers, helping to give them a sense of security. And in a school setting, teachers are best placed to know how the pupils' needs can be most effectively met and to ensure they continue to make progress, even when isolating or shielding. Some children with disabilities were or are still unable to return to school as the right support has not been put in place to meet their specific needs. This means many of them have missed out on vital care that they would normally get when attending school, such as physiotherapy. And they've also missed out on a lot of social interactions and the activities that they would normally do throughout the school week. This has impacted greatly on their mental and physical health. Many have also found that sleep patterns were disrupted as their routines had changed. We, we all know the importance of routine 
it helps family members know who should do what, when, in what order things need to be done. Uh, they can help a child feel safe and secure. If these routines are disrupted, it can impact greatly on a person's well-being. To enable school provision to actively progress during this time, scheduled meetings were held. Uh, these could have been between staff, occupational therapists and other relevant people who are important to these individuals' needs. Some people with disabilities have thrived on increased time with families and a slower pace of life with decreased demands and they've been able to focus on learning daily living skills at home such as toileting. All of us, all of us can make a positive difference in the lives of others. There are many ways to support the people we care for, family, friends, neighbours, people with disabilities as we deal with the pandemic and its aftermath. For example, you could check in regularly to assess their needs, offer emotional support and safe opportunities for social interaction. The move to remote working over the two years has been welcomed by many, but as we start to live what some might say is the new normal, we don't want to lose the changes have helped make the world a more inclusive place for people with disabilities. The lessons learned during the pandemic are endless, from the frailty of schools as social safety nets for working families to our systematic ability for advancing technological equity when compelled to frontline worker status of teachers, to the direct correlation between classroom sizes and culture effectiveness. If we are going to do a better job next time um, our nation and world are paused to pivot in response to a crisis, we must situate ourselves as learners of place. Every community has its own distinctive footprint which often forms and informs how the residents within that community navigate and make meaning of what it means to be a resident. Whilst it seems COVID isn't going anywhere anytime soon, we think of how we can prepare for another wave. Schools must deepen their investment in community-centred knowledge, family engagement as a matter of trust building and therefore ensuring all pupils' needs are met to their full potential. We must recognise that some of the solutions to the pandemic have made a more inclusive place for the people we care for. It's important to reflect on these and ensure that they're not lost as we move beyond the pandemic. The inclusion of people with disabilities in the COVID-19 response should be remembered throughout. A better future must grow from learning the lessons listening to the life experiences of people with disabilities and making meaningful investments that improve the well-being and socio-economical conditions of people with disabilities. If, if the pandemic has taught us anything, it is that everything and anything can be changed and we shouldn't take anything for granted. We must all work consistently to provide the very best for the people we care for minimise disruption, ensure we maintain a collective and collaborative approach to protect everyone's well-being. Remember, as difficult as it might be, stay positive, off, offer constant reassurance, make them feel safe, amplify their voice, facilitate opportunities for them to share their feelings, concerns and experiences. Their voices need to be heard as part of the effort towards an equitable, equitable and inclusive approach to disability in times of the pandemic and beyond. I think we could all agree that the past two years has posed many challenging and sometimes extremely difficult situations to overcome, but we as carers who have the interest of people with disabilities at heart 
we're ensure that everything possible will continue to be done for those we care for, we have to remember the resilience and how amazing they are putting up with everything that we've all had to go through. Thank you for, thank you for taking the time to join me today and a special thank you to Joanna Grace who without her we wouldn't all be here today. I hope you all enjoyed the rest of the conference and a big shout out to all the other presenters. Um, enjoy the rest of the uh, conference everyone and goodbye. <laughs>